didn't know that uh, Brett was going to sing that last song before the sermon, but it fits well with what I intend to do this afternoon. I was thinking on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ there in Jerusalem as recorded by the inspired Luke in Acts chapter 2, that as the apostles all stood up to preach, guided by the Holy Spirit, we have Peter's sermon recorded as he stood up with the eleven. And after he had preached the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the people who were devout Jews gathered from every nation under heaven because they came as the law of Moses required to observe the Feast of Pentecost. They had no idea of the events that were going to transpire on that first Pentecost day there in Jerusalem following the resurrection of Christ. So when he preached to those people, he wasn't preaching to a bunch of heathens or folks who did not know God or the Old Testament or those things. He was preaching, as the scripture says, to devout men. That is, they were serious about what they were doing in serving God. But then they heard the message, and lo and behold, the very Messiah that they had looked for Peter says, you have taken them with wicked hands of crucified and slain. And of course, he goes through the sermon uh, offering proofs that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was that Messiah. Besides the miracles that were done, the apostles speaking in languages they'd never studied, the sound, but not a wind, but the sound of a rushing mighty wind that had come down from heaven, and remember, there was no wind, but it was a sound of one. The Greek there indicates it would be like a, a roaring hurricane, like sometimes we've heard around here and further south. But there's no wind. And thus they all rushed together, the people there, and wonder what's going on. I think we all would. And then they hear the apostles who also have these cloven tongues on them. It wasn't fire, but it looked like fire. And they're speaking in their own languages. And they say they're speaking in those languages the wonderful works of God. Then we have Peter standing up and proclaiming the truth along with the rest of the apostles. And because they're speaking in these languages that they had never been schooled in, for they had no formal education, that later on would amaze the chief priests and others because they, they had that kind of ability when they had had no formal training. They tried to make light, some did, of it, saying these men are filled with new wine. Well, Peter uses the opportunity to get up and declare these are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he starts what is Joel 2 verse 28 and quotes that, and you find that there in Acts 2. But then he goes on into his sermon, and he gets to the end of it, and he says, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus both Lord and Christ. Actually, both Lord and the anointed one, for Christ means the anointed one. You might take note as a side interest when you read Paul many times writing of, of our Lord, he will say Christ Jesus. Well, it's not just switching the last name for the first. He means to say the anointed Savior, the one God has approved of, ordained, and appointed to be a Savior. So after he has declared these things, you'll see you come down to Acts 2.37, and they've been listening and understanding, as well as seeing the miraculous signs that confirm that what the apostles were preaching was from heaven and not from men. So it says they were pricked in their heart when they heard these things. Now remember, they are not heathens. They are not immoral people. These are devout Jews gathered out of every nation under heaven. And they're learning that the religion they were in, no matter how devoted they were to it, how right they were in living according to it, it's not going to do you any good anymore. 
what in effect is being said, it's time to get out of that because here the gospels preach for the first time in its fullness and the Lord has established his church. Now remember Matthew 16, 18, he promised the apostles, I will build my church. And thus we see the church in Acts chapter 2 brought into existence. Peter preaches that Christ is now ruling at the right hand of God. Well, he can't rule without something to rule over. And what is it? It's the church. It's the kingdom. The kingdom and the church are one and the same thing. They're just different terms to describe different aspects of the same body of the saved. Even as body is used or church is used or sometimes temple is used to refer to the realm of the saved because it describes different aspects of it. Well, then these people cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, it's implied that they're saying, what shall we do to be saved? Save from what? Save from our sins. What is sin? Sin's not just because I don't like something or it disagrees with me in the sense of like eating something that upsets your stomach. Sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Romans 3.23 says that uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says plainly the wages of sin is death. Death meaning separation. The only thing that can separate a person from God is to transgress his law. Now, once it's transgressed, then you're cut off from God. That's what happened with Adam and Eve back in the garden. When they sinned, they were separated from God. Their physical bodies began to die. They were immediately spiritually separated from God. So God ordained a plan and gradually revealed it now through all of those thousands of years till he gets to the day of Pentecost. The Lord now has died, been resurrected. He's gone back to heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of God as Peter declares. And so the truth is preached. And these very devout people are pricked in their heart. That is, their conscience hurts them because they have actually opposed the very one they claim to be looking for and Peter said, you've taken with wicked hands, have crucified and slain the Son of God. Of course, he declares he's been raised and he's gone back to heaven. He's sitting and ruling at the right hand of God. So when they reach that point, then they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, if you were to listen to a lot of people nowadays and has been for a long time, they say, nothing you can do. God did it all. But they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter understood what they were asking. He, they were believers because of the truth that was preached, the evidence that was offered. Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. Well, he takes them as believers and he tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. But let's take this question. It's a simple question, but sometimes simple questions and little words have a great impact. So the question we're going to further analyze now that we set the backdrop of it is what must I do to be saved? And now we know it means saved from the sins that separate me from God. Remember, God's the offended party. We sinned against him. The forgiveness of our sins must take place in the mind of the one that was offended, and that's God. God has to say, you're forgiven. Now, other people may say you're forgiven when you're not. I'm interested in when the Bible teaches me that God says, he forgives me of all my past sins. That's what these people are interested in. And yet they've been doing their best while they were under the law to do what God required of them. But now that's not going to work anymore. A new religion has come on the scene. And of course we know it's Christianity. So we'll see more about that later. But the question is what must I do to be saved? Now when you begin to analyze the question, you may not think, well, there's very much here to be analyzed. But look at the first word, what. What. That word suggests something required of man in being saved in view of the very 
meaning of the question, what the question's concerned about. And he who asked the question understands that fact. Those people understood that on the day of Pentecost, that as believers in Christ, they wanted to know what to do. So we look at the word what and see that significant part of it. Then they say must. Notice it's not a question of what should I or what may I, but what must I do? There's no option to it. You don't have multiple choice and pick any one you want and it'll work. Must, M-U-S-T, teaches the absolute necessity of the requirement. Peter, by the Holy Spirit, for that's how he's speaking, and Luke, of the Holy Spirit, who recorded the book, is giving us this on the day that the gospel is first fully preached and the day the church started and the day people were inducted into the church. So must teaches this absolute obligation or necessity of whatever is required. Some people say there's nothing required on the part of man for God to save him. Well, then this doesn't make any sense. What must I do? What must we do? Now we come to the word I. Well, it's not what Christ or God or the Holy Spirit or angels, but it's what must I. It's very personal, doesn't it? It's what must I do. When I'm studying the Bible, I might realize there are other people that need to know this and I want to teach them that and but I must be thinking of it as, how does this apply to me? It begins there. When um, Paul was addressing the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he said, take heed unto yourselves, and then take heed to the church. When Paul speaks to Timothy, he says, take heed unto yourself, and then otherwise. It doesn't do any good to have it in the order in which God gives it. To be thinking of everybody else, when you have something, an obligation in this case, a requirement that needs to be done. So when you're listening to a sermon, when you're studying your Bible at home, when you're in class, we ought to be thinking about what's God saying to me? What's he pointing out to me that I must do? That's my responsibility, nobody else's. Now Eric over here may, may know exactly what the Bible teaches. And he's willing to teach me. But if he teaches me or somebody else teaches me exactly what Peter preached on that day that he read about, and it's there for you to read, if I don't take it personally, if I don't apply it to me as something I've got to have to do me any good, if I don't as a free moral agent and God made me with free will, if I don't choose to listen and understand with the mind God gave me and then if there's the requirements that are set out to comply with those requirements, it won't do me any good. Yes, I should think about others that need the gospel. How's the church not going to function uh, or how's it going to function properly if it does not think of the gospel going to all the world as we're commissioned in Mark 16, 15. But it begins with me. Those of you who've obeyed the gospel, think of the time you obeyed it. Weren't you thinking of your, yourself and your spiritual needs? Seems to me that's what was totally on my mind when I obeyed the gospel. So it's the responsibility that I have in this matter. It's not what God's going to do. It's what I must do. After all, remember... Jesus has already come. He's been tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. He's already gone to the cross. He suffered, bled, died, been buried. He's raised from the dead. And now he's going back to heaven. So it's not what he should do. He's done God's part in saving us. And if that's all there was to it, you'd never have Acts chapter 2. Because Acts chapter 2 is teaching me my personal responsibility to discharge whatever obligation he lays upon me to benefit completely from what God has done for me through Jesus Christ that I never could do for myself. Then look at the word do. 
Notice it's not what, what I must get. You hear people sometimes say, get religion. Well, I don't know. That's not biblical terminology. So it's not what I must get. It's not even what I must think, though certainly proper thinking is involved. It's not what kind of good warm feeling I get. It, it's not what even I should believe in. It's not that at all. Notice the word is do. How many people read this and yet they think about getting religion or thinking good thoughts or they're thinking about feelings and good emotions or they think about believe. But these folks in Acts 2 are already believers. They're believers in Jesus Christ as Son of God by the truth that was preached by Peter and the other apostles. And they cry out as believers, men and brethren, what shall we do? So do, the word do, suggests activity on the part of the person being saved from that person's own sins against God as we've discussed it. So salvation is not a matter of no activity on the part of the one being saved at all. The activity of the person being saved is submitting to the obligation set out in the gospel that one must submit to. Even when a person is baptized, somebody is assisting that person being baptized by immersing them in the water. It's passive in that sense, but why is the person in the water in the first place? Because he's discharging what is an obligation to do, and that's activity. So God's power to save, which Paul says is the gospel that he's not ashamed of, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, is bestowed upon man when man does what God has commanded. He does what God says and the way God says it, and for the reason, maybe sometimes there's more than one reason, that God says, says it. And that way he can know he's fully obeyed whatever the command is. Now listen to what he said here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, but watch this, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So no wonder in Acts 2 and verse 40 on that same Pentecost day that we're talking about that Luke records and with many other words did he, that's Peter, testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. Well, I thought Jesus was my Savior. I thought he paid it all in shedding his blood and dying on the cross. He did as far as deity is concerned. The problem is, is people don't realize the person that needs the salvation has to some way appropriate the blessings that Christ freely gives and no man deserves. These people understood that on the day of Pentecost. They've been convicted of the truth that was preached that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. They realized that the very one they longed for through the years who the prophets spoke of, coming the Messiah, the anointed one, they had put to death. Peter doesn't put any punches with them either. You have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. But I know they're honest and we must have an honest heart, Luke 8 verse 15, so that the seed of the kingdom, the word of God can rest there by it is in our minds and that's what the word heart means. And we can understand the will of God for us. And evidently, they realized that was needful on their part when they cried out, many brethren, what shall we do? And he tells them, as believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Here's what it comes down to. You take the word do, D-O, the word do out of Christianity, and you destroy it. A whole book on that is found in the book of James. James is making it quite clear. It doesn't do any good to say you're a Christian, a member of the church, yet you don't do what God requires of you as a Christian to be faithful. And so James, when you read that, 
he's really getting on the members of the church. They've already obeyed the gospel. They've been added to the church by the Lord, but they're not living like the Lord said they ought to. And so he makes it clear, you have to be active. You have to be working in the kingdom of the Lord. Now watch this, and I challenge you to challenge me on it. You never read of an inspired man, never read of an inspired man telling a sinner that there's nothing for him to do to be saved. You may hear that a lot coming from various pulpits over the land. Open your Bible. That's the only true, perfect source book of Christianity. There it is. And you try to find where an inspired man tells anybody who's outside of Christ and lost in sin that that person doesn't have a thing in the world to do to be saved. It's not there. And you see right here at the beginning of the church in Acts 2 in Jerusalem that there's something for them to do. They knew it and they asked. Now notice what, we, what must we do and we see to be saved. This phrase tells us the very purpose of complying with the conditions that are set out. There are conditions of salvation. Somebody says, no, there's not. I've just been reading Acts 2. It's the Word of God. It'll read the same way and mean the same way on the Day of Judgment as it does now. And it says there is. Those people understood they had conditions to meet. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Why didn't Peter say, there are no conditions to meet? You don't have to do anything to be saved. But that's not the way your Bible reads. And if you didn't, if you never heard of me or anybody else, and you've got a reputable translation of the Bible, it's there and been there for nearly 2,000 years. So he says it's to be saved. Well, this is the object sought by the one doing the questioning. What must I do to be saved? The phrase also suggests that the saving is done by somebody else. But what must man do to be saved by the Heavenly Father? Well, we've set this out, I think, pretty clearly, but there's a sure way to answer that question. Simply turn to the Bible and read the question and the answer giving, given. If it's found 25 times, then read it. Note the answer given. If it's found 1,000 times, read it and note the answer given. If we don't have enough interest and take the time to read the truth of God's word to learn what my duty to God is, there's not much use of us doing much of anything. So if it's found a hundred times in each question and each answer given there too, this is the scriptural and right way. But we find that it's mentioned, not a hundred, not fifty, and not twenty, but four, only four times in the New Testament. And by the way, one of those was while the law of Moses was still in effect. The question was first asked by the rich young man who came to Jesus in Mark 10, 17. Well, there still, as Jesus lived his life under the law of Moses in the flesh, he was a Jew. They approached God by the law of Moses. So he referred this young man to the commandments of the law. And I would say, as we try to study with people to make sure we know, too, about the right division of the word as we study it to understand the truth of God, then we have to understand part of the Bible covers the Jews while they were under the law, and that's the way they approach God. But I'm a Gentile, and I never was under the law, and the law was taken out of the way and nailed to the cross, Colossians 2, verse 14, almost 2,000 years before I studied or, or, or discovered America. So that doesn't pertain to me, it doesn't pertain to anybody today. Listen to what is said by Paul that I just quoted part of in Colossians 2.14. Concerning the taking away of the law as God's authority for man today, that is to live by. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You get a fuller understanding of this in Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews 9 verses 15 through 17, the scripture reads, and for this, that reads, for, for this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, 
for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Well, what's he saying? When Jesus walked this earth, he could forgive anybody's sins any way he chose to. And he did. The thief on the cross, they were still in the law of Moses. When he said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, Jesus said, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But when did the scriptures, the inspired word of God tell us, and we know this even from the way we write wills and why we write them. They are a force after men are dead. Jesus has died, been buried, raised up, and gone back to heaven. How do I know what his will is? You have a new testament. You have his will. And thus he would say, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, verse 48. So then I must be willing to understand that the authority of Christ is in the word of Christ, the new testament of Christ, the last will and testament of Christ. That's what these words say. And if they don't say that, what, would, what do they say? So the authority of he who saves me is put into the words of his will. So the answer Jesus gave to him, to the young ruler, is not the same that would be given today because he referred him to the law of Moses and specifically the Ten Commandments. Now it's good for us to note that this young man, being a very wealthy young man, went away sorrowful, for he was one that had great possessions. Now that problem is still around, because what it means is he only intended to do whatever he was told if it first pleased him. And that's really no obedience or submission to Christ's will at all. Submission to Christ's will is you'll do it though it may be distasteful to you because it's your Savior's will. He knows how to save you. You don't. Many of them are like this today. So we must be mindful then of that question. Now, that's the question put to Jesus while he was still on this earth in the flesh as a Jew, approaching God as were all the Jews under the law of Moses. That's taken out of the way. Now, the question is recorded three times in the book of Acts. And strangely enough, three different answers are given. And each is given by the Holy Spirit. Now watch it. All of them must be done. So we need to study for a moment these, what may seem to be on the surface contradictory answers. I've already referred you to Acts 2 on the day the church began, the day of Pentecost there in Jerusalem. And I'll go back over it because it is one of those questions and it fits into the three in the book of Acts. Brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.37 Remember we pointed out as believers, he told them in verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. But we didn't raise this. We mentioned it and really answered it, but we'll be more pointed here. Why were they not told to believe? Because they're, they've been led to belief already. The very question they raise indicates that they're believers and they want to know what else to do. They've already believed. Why well, tell a person to believe when he's already a believer? So he takes them where he finds them in their growth and he tells them to repent and be baptized. Now notice both belief and repentance are coupled together with the conjunction and. Wherever Repentance goes in that particular verse. 
Belief is connected to it. This, this and is like a coupling on a car, on a box car. If you've got two cars coupled together and you go to pulling one of them, where's that second one going to go? It's going to go right with it. Well, that's what a conjunction does. So it doesn't separate belief from repentance. It doesn't separate repentance from belief. But as believers, they were then told to repent and be baptized. So you have belief, repentance, and baptism. So it all goes along. There's no speaking one against the other. It's all in connection. Nobody is going to repent of their sins if they don't believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. But if they do believe, they must then repent. Acts 17.30 makes it clear that God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So it's a command. It's imperative. It must be done. But the believer repents, but he doesn't stop there, does he? Not according to the inspired word of God. And is baptized. And then forgiveness of sins. So salvation requires more than faith. It requires this change of heart, for that's what repentance is, because it's far more than saying, I'm sorry I did that, and then fall right back into it. That change of heart is a change of the inward man. It's change of the mind. It's a resolve if I'm in whatever sin it may be. When I see it's sin, I'm sorry toward God for the fact that it's there, which sorrow will work repentance, turning away from it, leaving it alone. Or if it's something that needs to be incorporated into our life, incorporating it into our life. It is not my will but thine be done. And that's the attitude that stays with the child of God if he's faithful the rest of his life. Now these people had done both. And we're sure of this because Peter didn't say, as some preachers are saying, well, all you have to do to be saved is just believe and change, have a change of heart. Well, I can read my Bible, you can read your Bible, and, and there it is. Peter told them, as believers, repent and be baptized. For what purpose? To what end? For the remission of sins. The Greek word is pronounced ace. Sometimes people pronounce it sounding like ice. Epsilon, iota, sigma. And it means in order to a given end. So you're baptized in order to a specific given end. Thus, you're a believer and you repent and you're baptized in order to remission or forgiveness of sins. I don't see how it could be much clearer than that, but there it is. But we have another one. And that's Saul of Tarsus. Remember he was as terrible a persecutor of the church as I ever thought about being. That's how he's introduced to us. In Acts 7, 58, 8, 8, 1, Stephen is stoned. He holds the clothes of those that stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And later he said of himself concerning zeal persecuting the church, Philippians 3, 6. And he was very bitter in trying to stop the mouths of Christians, Acts 26, 10, and 11. With all of this, he still had a very clear conscience. How's that possible? He said many years later before the council at Jerusalem, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day, Acts 23.1. How could that be possible? What he means is I lived up to what I thought God wanted me to do. When I thought he wanted me to persecute Christ and the church, I did it. That tells me that your conscience can say, feel good even when you're wrong. The conscience does not determine right or wrong. It does what it does based upon what the intellect has been taught to be the right standard of living, whether it's moral or whether it's religious. So when he was informed properly, and understood in his mind, his intellect, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Then he kept his clear conscience. He gave up his error, and he embraced the truth. And that's how he could say that I've always lived in good conscience before God, even when he was persecuting the church, because he thought he was doing God's service. 
And when he finds out he's not, he doesn't give up his clear conscience and go ahead as a hypocrite. He keeps his pure conscience and gives up his error. A lot of people never have understood that. So his conscience didn't hurt him because he thought he was doing the right thing. But we must be sure we have the truth. Does that even give more emphasis to what Jesus said in the very common passage that we quote most often? If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I know you can know the truth pertaining to salvation. How do I know that? Jesus said so, and he doesn't lie. He said, Paul did, Acts 26, 9, as Luke records it, I verily, which means truly, it's a fact, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name, which means the authority of Jesus of Nazareth. And he did. But when the truth came on him, he gave up the pattern of error and embraced the pattern of truth and kept his clear conscience all the way through this is certain proof that a man's conscience cannot be accepted as the guide in religious matters. It just can't. I remember some of you might know of it. You may have seen it on television or YouTube or somewhere. Uh, Pinocchio, made by Walt Disney back in the 50s. I guess it was 50s, early 50s maybe. And you remember Jiminy Cricket and he sang the song, Let Your Conscience Be Your Guide? Well, that's partly so. I would tell somebody, never violate your conscience. What you need to change is not the conscience. It just says, feel very good. You're living up to the standard you think is right. Or feel very bad. You violated the standard that you think is right. I'd say change the standard. That's what you have to do. And let your conscience keep doing what it always did. As long as you think you're right you will have a clear conscience. So I've got to be sure I am right. It's almost, it's a very strange thing today to me that people have almost got folks thinking, uh, you're some sort of terrible person if you think you're right. Now, how do you raise your kids? Now remember, little Johnny, don't ever think you're right. Well, what is he supposed to think? <laughs> I'm wrong all the time? Well, they don't want that. Well, don't ever, don't ever tell anybody you're right. You can't say that. That's politically incorrect. Well, you don't find that in the Bible. So the thinking of a man must be changed by the truth. That's what's said in John 8, 32. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Saul's question and the answer given Saul, of course, was on his journey to Damascus to persecute Christians. Jesus didn't appear to him to pardon him from his sins. If you think he did, then that's a mistake. People were being pardoned from their sins through the preaching of the gospel, believing it without ever seeing Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian today, that's what you did. You've never seen the risen Lord. You've done what you did on the basis of the evidence in the gospel that proves that Christ is the Son of God. Why then did Jesus appear to him? To make him an apostle of Christ. It's exactly why. Acts 26, verse 16. That miraculous appearance of Christ to him didn't save him. A lot of folks talk about him being saved on the road to Damascus. No, he wasn't saved. He wasn't saved when he cried out, men, in, uh, or when he cried out, Who art thou, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Well, what am I going to do? Well, you go into the street called straight there in Damascus, and there shall be told you what you must do. He still doesn't know. Saul, when he goes into Damascus, is still in his sins and separated from God. By the way, he's still sincere, too but he's sincerely lost. So after asking what to do, and Jesus told him to go into the city, Acts 9, 6, Saul lacked something. He's still lost. He lacked something. 
There's something absent from Saul's life. I think he's a believer. The description of him fasting three days and three nights without anything to eat and engaging in prayer, waiting for what the Lord said would come, he's still lost. He's still separated from God. Is he serious? Seriously lost. Is he sincere? Sincerely lost. He's on the way to salvation, but he hasn't found it yet. So what does he lack? Well, it's not faith. It's not repentance. That's evidenced by three days and nights fasting and praying, Acts 9, 9, and 11. That is, it's not that change of heart that is repentance. He's not saved. We do well to think about that. But then in this other account, there's three accounts of his conversion in the book of Acts. You remember that Jesus had appeared to a gospel preacher, Ananias, and told him to go there. In fact, he's scared of Saul because he has a reputation of killing Christians and arresting them. He knows about it. But he's faithful too when Jesus told him to go because he says, I've showed him how many things he must suffer for me. When he gets there, he recognizes what the situation is on Saul's road to forgiveness of sins. He sees a believer. He sees a penitent believer. And all he can do is say, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Why do you tell him that? Because that's the point that sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. Not at belief and not at repentance. But when he was baptized in the Christ for the remission of sins. So people say, well, you talk about the water. No, water fits in only because God says that's how you can be buried in water and raised up in the likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Romans 6, 3, and 4, 17 and 18. And that's what we did. Now, another question. The jailer. Jailer asked another. Paul and Silas were prisoners for preaching the gospel to the Philippian jailer, Acts 16. There's a, or preaching there in Philippi, and they come upon the jailer. Sometimes we want to reach people we don't realize we have to go to jail to do it. <laughs> God knew the heart of that jailer. It's interesting how he got them together. It's through persecution. There's, they're shut up in the inner prison. The real bad guys are there. Their feet are fast in the stocks. They've been beaten. The midnight, he, they must have amazed all those pagans in that prison when they're, they're singing praise to God. An earthquake comes along about midnight, and the scripture says all the doors were open, and everyone's bands was loose. Not only Paul and Silas, but all the prisoners are let loose. Well, the jailer has a responsibility, and as they did at that time many times when those pagans who had no concept of eternity or life like we do or a soul, these kill yourself to keep from having to undergo what they may do to you. So he's roused out of sleep and he sees everything wide open and everybody free and he's about to kill himself. But Paul springs out and says, don't do yourself any harm, we're all here. We haven't, nobody's left, everybody's still here. In Acts 16.30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, this is the jailer bringing Paul and Silas out. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He hasn't heard anything yet. He hasn't heard the gospel preached. But all that happening certainly caused a shakeup in his thinking and outlook and viewpoint. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, he's not a believer. So they tell him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Acts 16, 31. Well, then they take, or he takes them to his house, washes their stripes, and that's when they teach. They teach him. And he took them the same hour of the night and baptized them. There are three different answers to the same question. Why is that the case? Because they're each one on a different road, different place on the road to salvation. If I leave here and head for Dallas, and I get to Huntsville, I say, how far is from here to Dallas? They're going to give me one answer. 
But if I go on up the road a ways and I stop and say how far it's here to Dallas, they're going to give me a different answer. And if I go on up the road a little further and stop and say how far is here to Dallas, they're going to give me a different answer. Yet every one of them is right because I'm on a different place in my traveling on the road to Dallas. And that's the wonder of the book of Acts in showing these accounts of conversions to Christ. Takes people wherever you find them. Here's a person who doesn't even believe in God. And I tell him, you must be baptized to be saved. Well, that's true. Well, what if I don't give him the wherewithal by proper teaching for him to be brought to belief in God, belief in Christ as the Son of God, and all of that to get to a given point? You have to take people where you find them in what they know, and that means in what they don't know. And that takes a lot of work to do that. You can't assume they understand because the world out here is teaching everything but what I've taught this afternoon. And so is the denominational world. So there's three different answers to the same question. The jailer was an unbeliever, so what's he told to do? To believe. Well, since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, he had to hear the word. So he did. The people on Pentecost were already believers, we've said several times. So he takes them as believers and tells them to repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. But then you've got Saul of Tarsus who's a believer and uh, he's repentant and he's told simply as a believing penitent to be baptized. So they were given different answers because they were at different places on the road to salvation. And yet when you put it all together, every one of them did the exact same thing and traveled over the same road It comes down to right division, right usage, proper usage of the word of truth and knowing how to study it. Thus, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All of that's caught up in this. And if I ask that question, what must I do to be saved? Analyze the question first. Remember, what must I do to be saved? Then take your Bible and go through the New Testament of Christ because that's where His will is and it's nowhere else. Not back under the law of Moses or back under the patriarchal age back in Genesis, but under the authority of Christ set out in the words of truth, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. And then personally ask that question. So as we bring the lesson to a close today, this is something that's these truths, in other words, are going to have to be preached as long as there are people on this earth. Now, on the day of Pentecost, when they were baptized for the remission of sins, in Acts 2, verse 41, said they that gladly received this word were baptized. You look in that verse, you look in verse 42, and you look in verse 47, and the Lord added them to his church. They weren't saved, and then picked some sort of this, that, and the other church and joined it. You cannot join the church Jesus bought with his own blood. When you obey the gospel, you're baptized I-N-T-O Christ, into Christ, Galatians 3.27. The Lord adds you to everybody else that's done the same thing. The first denomination as we know them today did not appear to 1,500 years after the events of Acts chapter 2. They didn't know anything in the world about the denomination. They heard the truth. They believed it. They obeyed the gospel in being baptized into Christ. And the Lord added them to his church. And they began to fellowship those who have done likewise and organize them according to the teachings of the New Testament and worship according to the teachings of Christ in the New Testament. And that's the church. It's no hierarchy, conglomeration. It's simply people who are willing to take Christ at his word. And wherever they may be on the road to forgiveness of sins, They'll start from there and learn the rest of the story and comply with all God required of a person to do to be saved. If you're not a child of God, surely if you've listened this evening, you understand what God requires of us to become a Christian. As a child of God, if you do sin, you know that you can repent of your sins, ask God for forgiveness, and He will forgive you. God is in heaven wanting to save everybody. Lord is not slack concerning His promise, that is coming again 
as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Coming to repentance is action on our part. So again, we must want to know what our duty to God is as the Word of God sets it out. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, then we humbly invite you to come while we stand and sing.